everybody. Um, so yeah, like Caroline said, I'm Charlotte. I lead the research team here at Deliveroo. Um, I've been at Deliveroo now for just over three years, so I've seen it change a lot. Um, yeah, it's really, really changed, and actually it was really interesting hearing Sam's talk and just being like, oh god, yeah, we've been through that, and it's like a painful time, but we're past it. It's like new challenges come and go all the time. Um, and today I'm just going to talk about like uh, what it's been like through the, the last three years, and um, for me personally, what it's been like hiring um, a team, which we're now at uh, 11 people in the research team, um, and the things that I've learned in the hope that like it might help other people in a similar situation um, kind of shortcut some of the things that took me quite a while to work out. Um, and for this talk, I've gone a bit rogue. Like, I don't really know, like, apologize in advance. I don't really know what I was thinking, but I started off being like, oh, it's a bit like the tortoise and the hare, like the Aesop's fable, where like slow and steady win wins the race. And like, um, if you kind of, uh, if you're the hare in, in hiring and you sort of sprint finish and you have like this number in mind that you want to get to, like what you find is that you actually end up with like for many different reasons, like a broken um, team situation. Um, and so I was like, yeah, like it's, you need to be more like the tortoise. And then I started like looking for quotes from the t tortoise and the hare. And then before I knew it, like I'd just become obsessed with Aesop's fables and their, and their morals. So now like 50% of my talk is uh, based on the morals of Aesop's fables. So apologies, but like... <laughs> It's just the way it's gone. So um, uh, this is my first example. So um, another very wise thing that uh, Aesop says, so better to be wise by the misfortunes of others than by your own. And like I said, like um, I have learned quite a lot in the last three years of hiring the team. And so hopefully um, some of the things I've learned can be useful in the, the challenge that some of you might be facing at the moment. Um, so yeah, so Aesop's first uh, moral today is uh, prepare today for the wants of tomorrow. And I think this really relates to, um, to my experiences in hiring in the sense that like by the time that you need to hire someone, it's far too late to start thinking about hiring. And um, I definitely have learned that the hard way over the last few years. Um, Finding someone great to join your team always takes much longer than you expect it to. And like, really, I would say that there's never, um, it's never too early to start thinking about what your team might need to look like in the future because you can put a job spec up and you can just start having great conversations with people. And even if it's not quite the right time to hire them, you've done some of the legwork then for later down the line when you might need a person who's got that skill set or um, of that experience level. Um, and also it kind of applies to your hiring strategy as well. So um, for me, I've found that like, um, it's, it's very important to sort of continue to look at the balance of your team and like continually reflect on uh, what kind of skill sets you're looking for. So for example, when we first started out, um, we weren't very well known. Um, we weren't necessarily able to pay kind of high salaries and that kind of thing. And so we were very much looking for um, junior researchers who were interested in the challenge of like kind of taking things on and running with it, but who might not have the experience level of a more senior researcher. Um, and I'd kind of got into the rhythm of thinking like, right, okay, so this is how I hire. Like I find people who've got like zero to one year of experience and then like I take them on and they're really promising and then I'll train them up and that'll be great and it was really really great and like all of the people that I had in that um kind of phase of the company are still with us now and they're excellent um researchers now and it's been incredible kind of like seeing their growth over the last three years but I suddenly got to a point where I was like oh if I carry on hiring at this level everybody is going to need my time all of the time because I'm helping them learn all of the things that they're doing and if I carry on like this, like people are going to have really bad experiences when they join the company where historically it's actually been quite great because I've had enough time to dedicate and kind of shape their experience. And I definitely got to that like realization after it had happened. And if I'd been able to kind of think of that sooner, then I could have started looking for more senior people who are typically harder to find and um, will take longer to hire. And I could have kind of had them in place um, ready to be able to continue to hire more junior people. Whereas the result has been that actually we only last month have hired our first junior researcher in uh, a year and a half because it took me that long to kind of build up the more senior bench and like get everybody to a level where we were then able to start hiring those more junior people again. Um, so I guess uh, kind of the overall messages in the way that this relates to hiring are always look ahead, like it's never too early to start hiring because you don't have to make a hire just because you've got a job spec out, but it just means like people are starting to realize that you are looking for someone and you're starting to get the word out of what you need. 
be deliberate about your hiring strategy. So just think carefully about what you need and make sure that the balance of the team is right. And again, like, you know, hire to fill those gaps and like think about it in that context. Don't, um, I guess, hire and then think, oh, actually, like it would have been great if we'd maybe put in place like a slightly different balance of the team. Um, whatever you do, do with all your might. So I felt like this one really applies to um, what I've learned in hiring as well, in the sense that um, I kind of, again, sort of naively thought I could just put a job spec out and people would be looking for that job. And so I would find somebody um, who suited uh, the role and that would be great. And I kind of did that, to be honest, for like maybe two years. I just like spec, I was trying to think like, how long did I actually do that for? And it was definitely a very long time. And it's just like, I was thinking, oh, you know, people will, people will come, like delivery is an exciting company, like we're gonna find great people and it's great. And then I sort of saw this like, um, sort of bottoming out of applications and people just weren't really applying um, and we weren't really able to find the right, uh, the right type of candidate that we were looking for. And I kind of, to be honest, got a bit bored at that point of hiring. And that is another thing that I wanted to say is like, it's okay if you're in a team that's constantly growing to feel like you're a bit sick of hiring. And like what I've actually realized now is it's actually great to give yourself a break from that and just think, I just need to take that job, job advert down, like wait until I've got a bit more energy again, and then actually launch it with um, like a proper sort of mentality around it, like build up an employer brand, think about like what do I actually want and therefore who do I need to target and um, I actually did that for the first time earlier this year. Um, I took all of our job specs down and it was like a scary thing because we were really really in need with more researchers and to not even have the job specs out there felt really like oh my god we're not gonna you know what we're gonna do like it's gonna ruin the team and that kind of thing but actually what it did was gave me the mental space to switch off from kind of reviewing CVs that weren't really the CVs that I needed anyway, and think about like, how can we actually describe what we do here? How can we appeal to people who are the people that we need to hire? Because it isn't for everyone at delivery, like it's very, very fast paced, like it's very, very changing, and you need to almost illustrate that and showcase what, you're, what it's like to work here so that the people who will be keen are the people who apply. So we took the job specs down, and instead I wrote like a launch plan and I divided up the job specs. I, I turned one, um, one advert into four adverts so that they were slightly different specialisms based on the different skills that I thought we needed in the team. So we had one for usability, one for um, qualitative research, one for quant research, and then one for management. Whereas previously we'd only had like one or two job specs where it was more of a catch-all approach. Because um, I was like, we want people with specialist skills, so we should try and showcase that we want people with specialist skills. And as a team, we also got together and we talked about like what could be interesting things about um, our team, our culture, and our ways of working that we can blog about and that we can share ahead of relaunching the jobs so that when we do relaunch the jobs, people actually know about delivery and they actually feel a bit more excited about the thought of working in the research team rather than sort of like, oh yeah, that's the, food, that's the app I get food from. Like, I guess it'd be kind of interesting to work there and getting these kind of sporadic applications. And another thing I did was think about where do researchers go to find jobs now? Is it the same places that they were going to the last time that I applied for a job, which was actually at that point like uh, two and a half years or even longer ago? Um, and what I realized was actually like historically Twitter's always been the place that's been like my go-to for job um, kind of promotion and like uh, I guess like talking about your own, talking about your company. Um, but now I think that, that a lot of that has migra migrated onto Slack and actually um, thinking about what Slack channels to be part of and where to talk about what we're doing um, in a different way online actually had a massive, massive effect on the, the type of contacts that I was getting. I noticed that if I was tweeting, I was getting like a couple of responses, whereas if I posted on a Slack channel, I would get like nine or ten responses straight away from people direct messaging me saying that they were interested in the role. Um, so with this one, I guess it's kind of like, so posting a job advert is not enough to attract great candidates. Um, think about the employer brand you want to create. Like you won't, it won't happen by magic. You might have an excellent culture internally, but if nobody knows about it externally, you're not gonna necessarily find the people that marry up to that. And make a plan for launching your job vac vacancy to maximize the impact that it's gonna have. Always when you see a job that's been advertised for more than say a month, it's less appealing. I think we probably all would agree that. So you've only really got those first few weeks to make a big impact and get the highest that you wanna get. Um, 
So thirdly, the value is in the worth, not in the number. I think this one was one of my favorite um, morals when I read it because I think it really, really ties to how I've come to realize um, you should think about hiring or specifically about building a team. Um, I remember when I first started hiring and I used to just, I used to, to be honest, interview like every single person that I got a CV from because I just felt so um, inexperienced that I just did not know how to think about which CVs would be, would result in a, a good candidate. Um, and then I'd get myself into a real muddle because I'd be like, well, their CV's not great, but I had a really good conversation with them. Like maybe they're worth a second interview and then like, or, or I'd have a good candidate um, on paper, but I wouldn't have a great conversation with them, but I'd push them through the interview process anyway because I thought that was what you should do when you had someone from like a good background. Um, I can remember I got about six months into sort of starting out building the team and I had like one of these situations and I sat down with my manager and I was like, I just don't know whether to hire this person or not. And he was like, well, why don't you know that? Like, why do you feel unclear about that? And I remember he said to me, like, if you don't feel excited about working with this person, you shouldn't hire them, especially not at an early stage. Like, you need to feel, like, really excited, like, instinctively that this person is going to be someone you can learn from, that they're going to bring something new to the team, and that you're going to be really, really happy to see them every day and never sort of... You, you shouldn't have a doubt in your mind when you're, when you're going through that process. I think that's a really hard thing to bear in mind when you can see the stress of your team day to day and you can see the burden that they're carrying as a result of you maybe being kind of slow to hire. And so it's about kind of like bearing that in mind and just remembering that like what you're actually doing is, get, is a favor to them in the long term, even if it's feeling like a disservice in the short term. Because if you hire the right people, they're people that your team can learn from, they're people who will support your team when they need it, and you will actually be building a better team overall. Um, so I would say this one is like almost the most pertinent thing that um, that I've learned since I've been hiring. So um, yeah, every single person you hire is a decision that you're making about culture. I guess maybe I thought that that would change as a team grew, but actually I think it's just as important now at a team of um, kind of 11, 12 people as it was when we were a team of three. Um, if you're not sure about a candidate, just consider why. There's no reason why you have to hire someone. Like, if they've come from a background that you really respect, then that's great. It might just mean that they're not a fit for your company, and that's absolutely fine. Um, if you're not instinctively excited about working with someone, then take the time to think about why. Is it, like, is it because their, their sort of behavior just doesn't, is there something off that, that you just don't think is going to gel very well with the team? This is a really tricky one because you want to be hiring for diversity. You don't want to be hiring people who just fit the mold of your team at that time. So think, do take the time to think about it. And I, I've, some of the people I've hired, like, I've had sort of initial reservations, but actually when I've unpicked it, it's been because they've got a very different working style. And actually that's sometimes a really great thing to add to the team. Um, but take the time to understand why you're feeling that way. And always it's better to be under-resourced than grow the team quick, quickly but compromise or lower the bar. Like, you can't correct later if you lower the bar on who you're hiring. Um, you know, it's going to cause you problems down the line. If you, if you hire people quickly who you don't think are up to scratch, you're going to spend a lot of time as a manager trying to um, help them get up to scratch. Or they're going to bring down the expectations of the entire team because they'll look at that person and think, well, they're not doing as much as I'm doing, so that must be what's expected now. Um, this is one you've probably actually heard of rather than the more obscure ones I found on Google. Um, so birds of a feather flock together. This is one of the things that I found the most challenging about um, when I first started hiring was the first time that someone turned down a job offer. And I was like, oh, that really hurts. Like, it's a great place to work. Why don't they want to work here? And um, it really kind of like, bothered me. And I was thinking, like, you know, is there something wrong about the team that I'm building? Is there something about working here that um, is unappealing to people? Um, but what I've realized, and again, it took me quite a long time, is like, actually, if I look back now on the people who've rejected an offer I've given to, uh, I've, I've extended, like, um, nine times out of ten, I think that that was the right move for both of us. Like, they wanted something different that they weren't going to get a delivery. And so we would have been really at odds the whole time we worked together. For example, um, I made an offer to someone who really, really wanted to basically do the job I was doing at the time, so start in a startup and start building up the research discipline there. And I really wanted her to work with us. And she turned, she turned me down, and actually now I look at what she's done somewhere else, and I think, well, she wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that here, and she would have always wanted it, and it would have been like, she wouldn't have been happy, and she might not have stayed very long. And it's fine, like, you know, that's not a match, and you want people in the company who 
are going to be wanting to work on the things that you've got um, to offer. So don't worry if a candidate that you really wanted to hire rejects your offer because the people will, who accept will be the people who are the ones for, that are the right fit for your team. Um, and then I've got a caveat here, which is as long as you've done a good job of showcasing them what it's like to work for the company. And this is kind of really important as well. I think, again, um, as Deliveroo have grown, we've really formalized the hiring process and we've really gone through like a number of iterations of how do we actually um, design an interview process that really kind of showcases who we are as much as it helps us understand who the candidate is. Because you really, really want to have that two-sided kind of discussion up front. You don't want to be having that when someone's joined and it's like they're having this horrible realization that the job is not what they thought it would be. Um, which kind of brings me on to this sort of bonus uh, moral, because I couldn't get enough of them. Um, do not attempt to hide things which cannot be hid. Like nobody is going to be fooled. Like once you actually, once they actually get in the door, they will know the flaws of your company. So if you've got challenges and you want, um, you want them to be solved, right? So you want to find people who are excited about fixing them. So um, I'm trying to think of an example. Like historically um, at Delivery, like we've always had to run before we can walk. Like that's the reality of working in a company that's growing this fast. Research here, you have to compromise. Like you're never ever going to be able to do a research project by the book because by the time you've finished it, like the team that you're doing it for won't care about the findings anymore. I've spoken to some really, really, really good researchers who have like excellent, excellent uh, method methodological rigor, who really would like raise the bar in terms of the way that they think about method and the way that they plan out the research and um, the large scale projects that they've got experience working on. But if they came to work here in the phase that we're in at the moment, it would be a disaster on both sides because the team that they were working with wouldn't feel that they were um, kind of providing value and they would feel frustrated because they weren't doing the type of research that they excel in. Um, and it can feel an, like sort of counterintuitive to hide the parts of the company that you, you feel are unappealing, but the reality is that you will find people who get excited by that, and those are the people that you want on the team because they're the people who will fix those problems. So, thanks, Aesop. <laughs> I actually don't know much about Aesop, so I like, Googled Aesop, and I just hope that's him. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that's kind of where the, the weird moral thing ends. Like, I couldn't find any more for the rest of the talk, so the next part is just my words, which is going to be very much less eloquent, but perhaps slightly less shoehorned. Um, so, yeah, so I guess the second thing that I wanted to talk about is that hiring a great team just does not happen overnight, and um, I've kind of advocated, I guess, that you should slow that down, if anything, rather than speed it up. So I thought I'd talk about some of the things that we've done at Delivery to sort of handle the fact that we just don't have enough researchers um, to go around and how we've sort of mitigated the downsides of that. Um, because sometimes it can feel like this poor woman here where like you think you've sorted something out in one area and then you just realize that the whole, um, the whole sort of workload has just cascaded in another area instead. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, one of the main things that we do here is put the researchers in the teams that need them most and just try not to worry that some teams are just completely going rogue and have no research and just don't know anything about their users. Um, and this was actually, it seems really, I feel like some of these might be controversial actually, I hadn't really thought about that, but um, this one um, is something that actually our old CTO, Mike, said to me on our first meeting and it really stuck with me because at that point I think I had three or four researchers in the team and the approach that I've been taking was to just sort of slowly divide our remit between all of the teams as we grew. So. You know, it began with just me and I was kind of uh, the researcher for like four or five product teams and then I got a second person, we took two each and then like so on and it just kind of like um, kept splitting it out. But the, the teams were growing faster than the research team was growing so people were getting more and more teams that they had to look after and they were spreading themselves thinner and thinner and thinner. And um, I said to Mike, like, if you've got one piece of advice for me, what would it be? And he was like, stop trying to cover every team. Like that's not the most important thing to do take the time to understand what the product managers are trying to achieve and then put the researchers in the teams that need them. And he was like, you'll know who they are, like just understand the problems that they're trying to solve and don't worry about the other teams. Like it's a shame that they don't have research, but you're much better off doing great research in some teams than trying to do some research for all teams. And um, 
when he said that to me, I was like, oh, but you know, how do you build a good product if you don't have research? But actually, um, in doing that, it really kind of helped me focus on what the biggest problems were and helped me really understand, like, did we truly have a gap um, where we needed a researcher? Or was it that there was just somebody who wanted research on their product? Like, what happened when we took research away from them? Um, so the next one is encourage your researchers to focus on formative knowledge so that it's useful for longer. Um, I think this one's probably a little bit more um, obvious, but if you do usability testing, then that's only useful until that product changes. So um, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot because you haven't got enough people anyway, and the research that they're doing is useful for like a few weeks until the designer has like created a next iteration, and then they have to do basically the same project again. Whereas if you focus on bigger picture problems and try and get people at the beginning of their design process, so for example, um, uh, we had like a project that we were trying to understand um, how to better schedule riders in for, um, for time slots so our riders can work whenever they want, so they log into an app and then they can just pick the hours that they want to work. But that's the situation now. Back then it was like a terrible, terrible experience. Um, but it's fine, it's not anymore. Um, but uh, we, instead of looking at like a design that a designer had made and trying to understand like what were the problems with that design, we were like, let's understand um, what do riders mean when they say that they want flexible working and what do they mean when they say they want job security because that can be translated into principles that we can use throughout the design process so if we don't have a, a researcher who can be dedicated throughout the team will have a lasting piece of insight that they can then refer back to to help guide decisions um, so that's another one um, help researchers find the right balance between rigor and speed so again um, Obviously, we would all love to do great research that's like completely infallible and um, by the book, but the reality is that if we do that, it's going to take us a lot longer than if we sometimes um, cut corners or do something that's a little bit more scrappy, but we'll get as an answer a lot quicker. Um, what I found through the last three years at Delivery is that what the balance is has like drastically changed. So when I first joined, it was very much like just get something to everyone. Like nobody had a clue, like no one had spoken to any of the users, and it was just literally like, a million questions all in my face at once and I was just like right okay I'm going to speak to five restaurants this afternoon and then you'll have a bit of knowledge and then I'm going to speak to 10 riders at a coffee shop tomorrow and then you'll know a bit and it was just like this kind of constant juggling act of like just making sure that everybody knew something um, and I look back now and I'm like oh my god I can't believe that I was encouraging people to make decisions off the back of that research like it was terrible and it was really really scrappy but actually then that was the right thing to do because it meant that it, I was guiding people in some way now the balance has drastically shifted and most of our projects last for, I would say, a month to sometimes even two months because we are focusing on the formative research and it does mean that we're able to front load that and like actually do things properly and we do things in multiple markets, we'll combine qual and quant and like honestly the landscape of research that we do is just, it couldn't even be compared to what we were doing three years ago. But I think that um, because that constantly changes, it's, it's our jobs as, as leaders to kind of really help the teams navigate that and advise whether they should cut corners or whether they should go a bit more rigorous and make sure that they are actually doing the right thing by the team and, and having the most impact in that way. Um, yeah, don't be afraid to radically mix up your team if you think the business would benefit. I think that um, especially this probably applies more to people working in bigger organizations. It can often feel that once you've set your sort of um, teams that that's the way they should be working, like the researchers in the product team, they've made great relationships with that person, like they should stay um, embedded in that team and they should like continue to build those relationships. Um, but actually what that can mean is that you're not focusing on the highest impact problems because people have actually delivered a lot of insight in an area and it's time for them to kind of move on and do the same thing elsewhere. Um, and what I've actually found as well is that it's really beneficial for the researchers because we like to solve problems and we need new challenges. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to have a little bit of water. Well, I'm going to choke to death on the front of the stage. So yeah, I think that is really um, kind of like a win-win situation to just allow researchers to tackle new problems and to really like get their teeth into a new situation that they might not have previously been in. Plus, it means that you're going to be tackling the biggest challenges in the business rather than just keeping people where they were. They're happy in their teams, but they might be sort of 
bottoming out in terms of the value that they're able to provide that team. And finally, invest in research ops. And I know that it's a luxury that we're able to do this here, but I think that, to be honest, it can really, um, it can really depend on what you call research ops. Here we have um, Saskia, who's here somewhere. Oh right over here, um, who's our research program manager, and then Maddie, who's our um, recruitment coordinator. And together, the effect that they've had on the team has just massively, massively amplified the amount of work that the researchers are able to achieve. Um, and sometimes the skills that you need for research ops, you can hire quicker than researchers. Um, so, and definitely, you should be definitely hiring in parallel because the effects are kind of like 10x on the researcher's ability to do their jobs. If somebody else is handling all of the recruitment, like for any researcher here, you know how long it takes to recruit participants. If somebody else is handling that, you can kind of like really stack up your projects because you don't have that really long lead time of just coordinating what's going to be happening. Another area where it's like fantastic, thank you again, Saskia, is um, GDPR, where that can take absolutely hours of a researcher's time, but if you have somebody who's able to put the processes in place, do the legwork with legal, and really kind of um, take that off the researcher's hands, they're again able to do more. So I think that this is something that tends to be a function in bigger research teams where actually it would be better to be a function in smaller research teams because the smaller your team, the more you need the extra resource. And so if you've got somebody else doing some of the jobs for you, then you can do more research, which makes a lot of sense and yet it doesn't really feel like it ever happens that way around. Um, so yeah, and then finally, I just have one more um, kind of thought to add, which is that I believe the goal should not be to have a team who can do research on absolutely everything. Um, this might sound strange because obviously, um, kind of especially like as people who are user-centered, we often feel like we should always be having the user's voice in the room whenever we're making decisions. But I think it's really good that you have to prioritize and that you have to make those tough decisions because it makes us question the need for research and it makes us work more smartly and it forces us to still take risks. And all these things are really, really important in a growing business. So yeah, that's everything. Thank you.